I'd like to introduce our host and psychotherapist for the series, I Am Not Okay, Kim Christine. Kim is the founder and executive director of Bay Ridge Counseling Centers and Human Strong, which is part of the Bay Ridge Circle of Care. He is an author and creator of several mental health programs in the area of mood disorder and anger management. For several years, Kim hosted a call-in national talk show called Nightlight and has appeared on numerous national talk shows speaking to the issues of mental health and relationships. Over his 40-year career, Kim has intimately worked with thousands of individuals, couples, and families to help navigate the challenges of mental, emotional, and relational health. Please welcome Kim Christie. Well, thank you, Amy. And and as Amy has said, welcome to I Am Not Okay, and it's uh, our third episode, and we're looking at the whole concept of chasing the help. And for our listeners, I want to provide a very short synopsis of our guest's stories in order to bring context to our conversation that follows. And our guests are James Altucher and Harris Goldberg. James has started and ran more than 20 companies, and he's currently an investor and an advisor to over 30 companies. But at one point, James lost everything. In a matter of months, his account drained from $15 million to $143. Depressed and on the floor, James realized that today's standard view of success comes with conditions. And the only way to be truly successful and fulfilled is to choose yourself and skip the line. Now James is a best-selling author, successful entrepreneur, angel investor, a chess master, and the host of the James Altucher podcast. Our next guest, Harris Goldberg, is a writer-director in feature film and television. He started making films after he sold his first screenplay within a week of moving to Los Angeles. He was signed to the William Morris Agency a week after that, where he secured his first screenwriting job for National Lampoon. Prior to this, Harris hosted and performed his own radio shows and did stand-up comedy at clubs across Canada. Harris's first love, however, was tennis, where he reached a Canadian ranking of number two in the country by age 18. Taking a year off to pursue the satellite tennis circuit, he concluded that tennis would not be his life's work when John McEnroe beat him 6-0-6-0. Deciding to stay in film and television, Harris went on to write the award-winning A Step Toward Tomorrow, starring Christopher Reeve. Other films he either wrote, co-produced, or directed, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, The Master of Disguise, Without a Paddle, and The List. Harris also writes for television for HBO, CBS, NBC, ABC, TNT, and USA. It was during this time Harris began suffering from stress and anxiety noting that it was the most frightening time of his life. After his recovery, he wrote and directed the film, Numb. Welcome, James and Harris. Today, we're going to attempt to resist our own ego's highly developed protection system and vulnerably share about mental health, anxiety, men, success, insecurities, and how we can hide right in the middle of a crowded room or even while we're performing on the stage of our own success story. So I would love, uh, Harris and James, perhaps you would be able to share a little bit about your own, let's say, some of your experience with anxiety. Harris, how about you go first? Well, I'm hiding right now as we were speaking, just so you know. Um, uh Anxiety has been a part of, for me, my, my life since I was the smallest boy. I mean, I, as I've gotten older and, and um, I don't know if I've gotten wiser, but as I've, I, I've gone through the traditional therapy programs and try, I'm, I'm kind of a, a uh, I would say a survivor trying to figure out the answer to this anxiety. Um, I realize there's a strong genetic component, um, but also 
I've learned quite a bit about the human condition, which helps my writing tremendously. But as, as I've always said, there's a tremendous price to pay for that because it's, it's a tough road to live with uh, ongoing anxiety because it's really like, um, for me anyway, it's like training, training at, for an athletic event. It, it, it's work because otherwise it'll, it can take over and paralyze you. And, and it doesn't take much to, to trigger it. And then once it does, it's sort of your evil friend. It's a weird relationship where you hate it, but you're comfortable with the pain of it. And you're so used to it, you know how to navigate around it. But it's an awfully complex, for me anyway, it's been, uh, it's a subject of my writing a lot, which I think it's the reason to get, uh, the, it creates the heart in my writing because people identify with it from their anxieties to one extent or another. But you're kind of play acting through life, you know, relationships, uh, you know, because you don't really, when you hit those depths, there's very few people you can really, you know, um, convey how, how difficult it is. And you have to sort of rely on yourself to s survive those moments to get to the next place. So it's a very, it's a very up and down roller coaster. So yeah, it's still an ongoing thing for me. I deal with it all the time. And I think I, I, you have to, I've accepted it's part of my life and my MO. And now it's how do you manage it and how do I navigate through it and try and find the best spots to be. And so you're, and so you're still working through it. You, you haven't found keys or answers that keep, have solved the issue. I don't think it's, it's not solving. It's, uh, it's, I have tools now. So in other words, take the pandemic. I have a lot of friends who, because of the stress of the pandemic are suffering intense anxiety, panic, what have you, depression for the first time. And they've never, they don't have any tools. So they've never talked about it. They don't have any mm -hmm. framework of why is this happening? So they're completely lost. And I remember that feeling when it first hits you, it's terrifying and it's amazing you can survive it. Um, but when you have tools, you can sort of, it's sort of, you can, you, you, you're familiar with the, the pain of it and you can kind of navigate yourself out of it using these tools. Uh, again, it's like playing a sport. So when I used to play tennis, I would play, if I was sore, I would go, well, today I'm sore because I didn't recover enough. How do I still get through the game using what strokes am I going to use? What spins am I going to use? How am I going to get through it? And you adapt. And I do the same thing now with anxiety. But even with those tools, it's still, I, it's not a fun thing to have, but it makes it a lot easier. So I, I just think I've become more experienced with that. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, Harris put it so well. I actually was thinking a lot about what he was saying. As he was saying, it just it kind of, changed almost right away some of my some of my own experiences with anxiety i think i've also probably experienced have been experiencing anxiety my entire life but when you're young you don't really realize it's, you have nothing to be anxious about when at least for me there was nothing for me to be anxious about i, I grew up in suburban new jersey and you know nobody was there wasn't it wasn't really a bad time but I think my anxiety took the form of obsession. So I'd always get obsessed with things and need things to be a certain way. Otherwise, I guess what I'd experience what I would now call anxiety. But it really, for me, it really became a very negative thing. Like, I don't think obsession is necessarily a bad thing. It, it, it drives you, it motivates you, it helps you learn things, it helps you accomplish things. So that maybe there's an upside to anxiety. But I think it became negative for me the first time I sold a business and then as you so eloquently reminded me of, I then lost all my money and this happened more than once. But that first time it happened, I suddenly saw a side of myself that I had never seen before, which is that I crashed and burned. I, I became so anxious. I couldn't sleep at night. I would wake up at like two, three in the morning and I would start writing down on a pad, adding up numbers, in my bank account and money coming in and money I was spending, I would just add things up trying to figure out how it could add up to a positive number so that I wouldn't go below zero. I had two kids and a house I was paying for. And I thought if my bank account went to zero that I went to zero 
and it would just kill me with anxiety. There was nothing I can do. And I would just, then I would, you know, walk around. I would literally circle Manhattan walking all night. And, uh, and that, you know, as, as Harris mentioned, is almost like a, a painful friend, a lifelong friend. It never really, I, I sense the lifelong aspect of it, but it never really was friendly. Like I really hate anxiety. I'm, it's as, as Harris said, it's painful. It's not like a, a fun thing. And, you know, I, it's, this wasn't the fr- only time I went broke. I've been, I've made money again. And then I went broke again and I made money again and I went broke again. There's almost three skills to money. There's making it, keeping it, growing it. And I would fail repeatedly at the keeping it and growing it. And, you know, finally I had to, not had to, but I saw a, a therapist about it. And one thing that was a big difference for me was making a commitment to not do things for the money, not do things I didn't enjoy doing. And so I started, I started writing and being honest about my experiences of going broke and being anxious and being depressed and being suicidal. And this was an odd thing because previously I had written for 10 years for the investment community. I would had a column in the Financial Times and a column in the Wall Street Journal, and I was writing uh, books about finance. And suddenly here was this guy who was like a talking head on CNBC. And, every, and everyone was like, well, why is he writing about going broke if he's <laughs> was writing about investing for 10 years. And, but I would just, I would just keep on doing it. And it it, it turns out there's a much larger audience for that than for people who want to know if (laughs) Apple is a good stock to buy or not. And, uh, you know, I realized what the only thing that would help me. And every time I would relapse this, I always have to remind myself to get back to this. And I've written about this before is, you know, having a daily practice of, you know, always trying to improve physically, emotionally, creatively, and spiritually. So at the end of the day, and that, and you could fill in the blank. What is physically? It might mean exercise. It might mean sleep eight eight hours a day. It might mean have a good diet. Who knows? Emotionally, maybe there's different relationships. I try to improve creatively. I always try to write every day and come up with ideas every day. And I write them down. I actually have a, I have a, a waiter's pad that I write down all my ideas that I've been doing since 2002 uh, but I try to do this every day and spiritually doesn't mean necessarily praying to someone or something, but for me, it means surrendering, like a, a accepting any regrets in the past or anxiety about the, the, or, or fears about the future. So I try to just ask myself, am I doing my daily practice now and everything will take care of itself. Now this doesn't always work. It's, it's, it's hard to keep with it. Like anxiety is almost, or the anti-anxiety is almost like this muscle that I have to constantly exercise or it atrophies very quickly. And then I'm anxious again. And so it's a, it's an, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing battle. And I've tried everything from, of course, of course, talk therapy, medication, you know, and this, this daily practice that I do and all in conjunction with each other, you know, I think I maintain, but and I, again, I still think there's also positive aspects of this. As Harris was saying, it's helped his writing. It's helped my writing. It's helped my uh, business experiences, like understanding how to navigate uh, anxiety because starting a business is a very anxious activity. For some reason, I'm, not only am I anxious, but I engage only in activities that create more anxiety. So I don't know why I continue. <laughs> well, to do that. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing uh, that uh, what, what uh, started the chicken or the egg. Can I, one of the, what, Couple of things you guys mentioned that I I, I just want to touch on is number one is for men at least in my experience it's very difficult to have them express that they uh, have a feeling or feelings or difficult feelings are pain they oh it's, I'm fine I'm fine but you use the word with for anxiety pain and I found that that interesting that it's like uh, psychological or what you say emotional physical is it it's literally uh, like you say a, an evil friend but it's it's pain how is it pain? It, it, it's like a you know it's interesting first of all we i think i've never met james before but it's like 
I'm sure we now share the same DNA because it's like listening to myself. Uh, because same thing, money, it, it's, it's things with money, exercise. It, it, I think it comes down to, it, I always, the two words that, that, that hit me is a search for safety and certainty, which are things you, that are not absolutes. And so I'm literally, or you're literally going after things that are, are impossible to gain. So that everything you do then becomes, you're trying to go, do I have enough money? Did I blow? Did I screw up here? Did I do this? What if this? And so everything is this look for certainty, which drives you. And the, is that, sorry. And is that a way that you're trying to stop anxiety? It's a way to be in a fine, if you, if you find a safe enough place, but it's a very, it, you, it, the only way you can have that safe place is you, you're in a great relationship. You're in a perfect storm of, of, of you know, a secure place, uh, financially, but is it things that are not realistic because the world doesn't work that way. And so literally the pain that certainly uh, that I talk about for me personally, I don't know if, if James shares this, but it's, it's like a, it's like a physical and mental, it's like a biological and psychological weight. And you can almost see it coming like a wave. You're doing something. It's, it's like a wave in the distance and you go, Oh God, you know, there here comes the wave. I'm okay. I can. And then when it hits you, there's nothing you can do except you're just holding on and waiting for it to pass you. And you're hoping that if I, if I go out and do, you know, 80 hills, in my case, you know, somehow biologically that will alter it. Or if I, if I don't catastrophize on something, like there's a couple things right now as we're speaking that I'm waiting to hear an answer on. And I'm catastrophizing the worst. And I have to have self-talk going on in my head going, there's not going to be certainty. It could go either way. You've got to let it go. But the voice is always there knocking. Hey, Harris, let's hang yeah. out. You know, oh, yeah. I, I'm curious, Harris, if in a weird way, when you were younger, playing tennis was a way of, and this is going to sound an odd way to put it, it was a way of self-medicating. Because if if you're feeling anxious, but then you play tennis and you win, you get this rush of dopamine, which is like almost chemically battles the anxiety for that moment. But then if you lose, I bet you you were crushed. Absolutely. But it was more than that, James. It was, I found being on that court, that 78 by 20, 36 feet school, you know, thing and being at a club and, and, and just going, all I need to do is control this ball down the line at this rate. It, it all seemed, I was, I, I was, I was, I was, I was talking about this earlier. It was all very black and white. Like I felt in control of that. And as soon as I walked onto a tennis court, I would get that feeling. I felt yeah, control. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering that because I, I, I used to uh, I used to be a day trader, for instance, which is a very anxiety producing thing to want to do yeah. if you're prone to anxiety in particular. And it was horrible. So, you know, some days you make money, some days inevitably you lose money. And on a day when I would lose money, I would gravitate towards like one of the online chess sites and I would just play one minute chess obsessively to kind of like almost like shooting up that dopamine by winning chess games as quickly as possible. And I still do that to this day, which is detrimental to whatever career I'm pursuing or detrimental to my chess even, because that's not really the way one should approach competition. And, uh, you know, and, and in terms of, of your, your, your question about is it physical pain? Is it psychological pain? I don't know if there's a difference. Like it's almost as if you have a toothache in your brain and imagine if you have a toothache and you go to a party and you're trying to be, uh, Oh, I'm getting a, I'm getting a call. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Uh, imagine going to a party and you have a toothache. You're not going to really be able to focus on what people are saying. There's some filter between you and the people at the party. You can't talk to them and have a normal conversation. They're talking to you and all you're thinking about is, I have this enormous pain and this person is speaking words at me and I have to say words back. So you're faking saying words back instead of being authentically who you are because anxiety is always there between you and the people around you because you're stuck in your head being anxious. And the more anxiety I feel, the more, you know, the harder it is to to function physically and psychologically. Like the first time I went to a, a therapist for this, 
he said to me, okay, James, what can I do for you? And I said, the only thing that can help me is if you write me a check right now for a million dollars. And it's to Harris's point that you're asking for something. I was asking for something impossible. He wasn't going to do that. But I really felt that was the only way that was going to finally get this annoying, gnawing, ongoing, chronic pain out of my head. And he said, I don't, I think even if I did that, that probably wouldn't help you very much, which I think it would have helped me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, he's the doctor, so whatever. Guys, uh, but when you are, when you're you're sharing this, my heart is 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 kind of crying when I think of you sharing this experience. And then whenever I think, guys, of what it was as little boys and what children are experiencing, like how i mean how, this is experiencing this is being experienced by by a lot of parents watching children and not identifying with them how did that when you look back on your childhood and realize that you were suffering and that's what you just described you were you just described suffering to me and and you were being raised suffering um, and, and then whenever you, you talk about, uh, uh, I know my brother uh, often looked at uh, both those things. I, 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 I do the both terribly, tennis and chess, um, but, but I happen to like them. But uh, my brother uh, once looked at, uh, I think, the U.S. Open or Wimbledon, and he, and, he, and, he, and he made this comment while we were watching it, and he says, it must be a very difficult, lonely sport because you can't talk to a coach. You can't say, how am I doing? You can't, you don't have someone handing you a water bottle. You don't, it's, it's, you are out there battling mentally, etc. all alone. And chess is the same way. You are all alone. And did, is that kind of, as you're, you mentioned, is that a kind of a self-medication? Is that part of what anxiety does? It, it pushed you into things that you do alone? Yeah, I, I, would, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, it's, it's fun. I didn't know that James was a great chess player, but I play chess every day with the same guy just because, because it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, just, it's like a Zen thing. It's not, it's not so much about the winning. It's, it's just the it's something soothing about it. But, but I, I, to, to answer your question, I think, I think as you're, as a boy, when you think of yourself as a young man, like I see, I have a picture of myself when I'm very small and I didn't know this till recently, really the last few years. But when I look at that kid and I, I actually, I actually feel sorry for him because I realize how, 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 uh, you know, I came from a, a background where I had a mother that was particularly, um, um, she suffered from major anxiety and depression. And, and now looking back, she was not prepared and she did not have the ability or, uh, at that time to be a secure mother. So as a kid, you know, you're being brought up in sort of a flawed environment where you, where you don't feel safe because you go, uh, oh, geez, I, I, it's my responsibility to entertain her. <laughs> what can I do to uh, <clears throat> make things all okay. right? And that set becomes the set point for the rest of your life in relationships and business. And, and, and it's, it's almost a curse because you become very charming and adept, but there's a, again, a real price to be paid because you're not being authentic. And so I can go into any meeting with anybody at any level and make them laugh and charm them up and get them to, Oh, this guy's great. But at the end, I can't tell you how many times I leave that meeting and I almost have to hold onto the wall and go, Oh God it's a drain. It's like, it's like a performance. And as you get older, you start to go, you start to resent having to do that. And you go, well, I don't know who I am if I'm not doing that performance, but it's effective because it helps you with business. It helps you in today's world. But the kids today, you know, I really like kids and I love directing kids because when I see their pain, uh, I really identify with the insecurities. And so by having to talk to them and parent them, even though you're not their parent, it, it allows you to kind of go, oh, I see what they're going through. And if they continue on this route, the, I can see the patterns here. They're going on a trajectory that's going to have some, you know, future problems. And I feel sorry for them because I go, oh, I wish I knew. I wish they could know now what I knew. I mean, what, what they could know then. No, they, you know what I'm saying? 
Uh, so uh, I'm kind of rambling here, but it's it's. Uh, no, I appreciate I appreciate sharing sharing that with regards to the children and, and the aloneness, uh, because there is there must be this experiencing anxiety or compulsions depression for sure, there is a sense on which uh, I often say with anxiety, your world shrinks, your internal world shrinks, and it becomes a, a, a very sense of aloneness, especially if you don't talk about it. And and children don't know how to talk about it. Parents often don't know how to talk about it. We're just barely learning as a profession and everything else about what the value of talking uh, does. Can I can I move a little bit to another direction, guys, and talk about you both have done some, uh, I think, some comedy. And um, to what degree, you know, we always talk about the class clown and the comics who hide behind their humor. And you kind of mentioned that you are kind of. Of uh, on uh, playing, to what degree is that true? And and to what degree, what what is all this self deprecation all about? When when you hear the uh, comics, uh, what's that all about? You know, so so I've been I've been doing stand up for about six or seven years, and it's a very unusual thing. It had nothing to do with anything in my background. I just got on stage one time and I fell in love with it, but also it's an extremely either high at the end of a set of comedy, you're either experiencing a huge amount of dopamine or a huge amount of anxiety and, and cortisol and stress and, and, and so on, because it either goes well or it doesn't go well, or, or it's medium, which means it didn't go well. It's only good if it's great. <laughs> and self deprecation is an important part of, there's a lot of things that are important parts of comedy, but, so nobody wants to hear about a guy who's doing great in everything. And people relate to the people relate to whether it's writing or performing or, or comedy, people relate to people who have problems. And sometimes those problems are funny the way you, the way we experience these problems and the things that happen, like you look at curb your enthusiasm that Larry David's a guy who just has problems, no matter how much success and wealth he has, He's he's got problems and that's funny. Even if you wouldn't want to be him or or be like him, it, there's there's something funny about about things going wrong. That's why once I started writing about authentically about experiences I had going broke, my audience of readers went up tenfold as opposed to me writing about how you should buy you know Google stock or whatever. And you know in terms of performance and, and Harris mentioned this, like he'd be in a meeting and he felt like performing. I, th I I'm realizing that, like I'm learning also from listening to, to Harris here. Like I even, I was I always tried to wonder what am I? I'm like a hyphenate career. And then at one point I even thought, Oh, I'm a performer. It just happens in different ways, but maybe that performance is always rooted in the anxiety of trying to, relate to people in different ways and trying to be authentic and so on. I, I, I do feel like uh, sometimes more of a fake performance than real, but that always is sort of a performance. And in terms of the kids, I just want to mention, I have two kids and one time when I was feeling super anxiety and depression, I was going broke. Someone told me, Oh, spend time with your two year old. This is, this is a long time ago. She's, 22 years old now, but uh, spend time with your two year old, take her out. And you, you, people always feel better with their kids. And that was not the case for me. Like I hated hanging out with her when I was anxious. I needed to, I needed to just be with me and not deal with anyone else at all. Even my two year old daughter. And to this day, when I'm anxious, I can't deal with anyone else. Chess, for instance, for me, a game that I love on a good day, but a game that's a prison for me on a bad day because I need to be lock myself in that prison when I'm feeling too, too anxious, either chess or writing or, or whatever. I'll give you another, I'll give you one quick example too. It's like when we first met before James got here, okay, before the show came on, I never met you before. So I'm going, okay, I, 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 you know, you seem like a really nice guy when I met you. So I'm going, 
okay, I know how I can get him to laugh and to, to, to think, oh, this guy's a cute guy right off the bat. And when, and so I started saying some self-deprecating thing, like you could tell, you could, you could, um, you could call this show death warmed over. Why? Because I, because I know that I am thin and all this sort of stuff. I know it's going to get probably, probably it's going to get a reaction. Just like I could, when I said to, to James, you know, Oh, I wish I had your hair because that's, I I've done it so much from when I was a kid. I just know the patterns and pretty much what makes, what makes the general public laugh. And I can just kind of bob and weave, but when I do that, I go, okay, I'm playing that card. I'm playing the self de- self deprecation card. And as soon as I go down that route, I've now started the engine of that's going to be the nature of the relationship. And so that's why I have a very confusing kind of, you know, people assume, Oh, he's this comedy guy. I don't even like comedy. I've just, because I can go to it very quickly. And so when I start to do more serious stuff, people are confused. They go, you're not that guy who, and they have every right to because I've, I've come off as a certain way because I wanted, what did I want? What am I looking for when I'm doing this self-deprecation? I don't love doing it. I don't like, I go, why are you cutting yourself up? Because I'm looking for safety and for acceptance. So if, if, if James goes, oh, oh, Harris is a good guy. You go, oh, he's a good guy. For that moment, I go, I got him. But you have to, then you have, to, you have to sustain it. And it's very hard to sustain self-deprecation and that kind of humor for very long, which is why having worked with all these SNL guys for many years where they would put me with somebody to write a script with them, you know, often it would be a year. I noticed they were all the same kind of guys, which were very dark unhappy, anxious, depressed guys, but they just like what I was doing, they could put that switch on. And for those brief moments of whether it's on stage or on a show or on a talk show, or when they had to do it, they could become very, very charming. And as soon as they turned it off, vicious. And you know, can I, can I ask you, that's so interesting in terms of like introversion, because if everything, if every social event is elevated to performance levels in order to get through that anxiety, then you, you very quickly run out. I, this is for me. I very quickly run out of energy and need to yeah. recoup. Like I can't, I can't socialize for, I'm not a shy person, which people confuse with introversion. I'm not shy at all, but I can't be with people for, for two, uh, an extended amount of time, like more than an hour or so before I just uh, need, need to shut down for a while. I mean, I mean right now, I, I don't mean to interrupt that, but right now, just make it real time. As we're talking right now, part of my mind's going, say something. Inter- I know I could, I could say there's about four or five things I could say right now that I think would get a laugh from the audience, which is what people do on talk shows. But if I, but I also think it's not, it's more helpful for somebody watching this to say, that's what I'm thinking right now is I'm going, do I pull that card and it takes us off being authentic right here? And, and do I want to go any deeper than this right now and, and convey that? And, and I, there's a part, there's a fear about that too. So there's a, there's a big voice saying, do that funny thing, make a reference right now. You can do it, you know, get, get, get a laugh, but you just get, I just go, I can't, do, I don't, I don't have the, I'm exhausted. I don't want to do that right now. Well, I think, I think uh, when I talk about anxiety, I often use the word and, and I think we can identify that, that there's a sense of energy and, and it's taking, it's eating up your battery. I often sometimes say that anxiety is like, uh, you know, the, the uh, engine of the car was, was designed to idle at 8,000 RPMs and, but, for those experiencing anxiety, they're 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 living at twenty thousand RPMs constantly, and it's draining and wearing the ba- the the engine out uh, in all kinds of areas, emotionally, relationally, etc. And but there is a sense of energy and and the rapid the rapid thoughts as you you talked about Harris uh, that they're just going like this and that is where I guess the tools uh, are, are so important to, to manage and, and, and handle that. And um, it's, it's, it is a challenge because our energies drop and, and because our, 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 our mind is, is moving so, so fast. Can I ask you gentlemen, and this is being really vulnerable, but um, 
Do you wrestle with self-loathing? Oh. I just, I just wrote, I was writing this morning. I'm doing a couple of pilots and I wrote the following line. I go, of, of course I, it's dialogue. And I go, Oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe God hates me. That was the line. That was in the, the voiceover. Oh my God. Are you kidding? Uh, but it's a weird thing because it's, it's, it's self-loathing in public, but it's tremendous confidence inside. Like I'm sure James, James could not start all these companies, raise money and do it. Just like I couldn't, direct a movie or write this stuff or exist in this business. If we didn't ultimately have this little secret, we go, Hey, we're kind of blessed. We got something worth, we know what we're talking about. We're a little bit, you know, you know, and, but we, but we, we would never say that out loud, although I'm saying it now. So you protect yourself by going, if I, the, the, the bar is so high because I believe I can compete with whoever. And when you don't hit that, you immediately go into self-loathing because you go, if I can't do that, there's something wrong with me. So you're constantly going between, like, like sometimes I wake up and I have those hours of the day where I, feel, I go, I feel confident, I feel driven, I can do this. And then again, when I see that wave coming and it hits, the self-loathing, the self-talk and self-loathing is so Herculean that it, your day's over. It's mm. just, it's, it's like, and, and that it's that Jekyll and Hyde existence. That's so draining because you're trying to find a balance and you go, why can't I find this balance? What am I missing? And that's where you start to go. Should I self medicate? Should I take more SSRIs? Should I dabble with this? Do I go see another psychopharmacal? Do I change my diet? Do I, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, again, this is just personal. I could be. I'm just no, sorry. no. It's the black and white thinking in in your mind, at, like tennis. It's it's clear. It's black and white, and it's you're all good or all bad. It's catastrophizing. Your brain tends to go there, and and I hear you. You know, and I, I want to add to that that it's not like it's not like people are feel anxiety, or I I don't feel anxiety when I'm just enjoying a TV show. Like if you want to be happy, just sit around and eat popcorn and watch TV all day. That's a happy thing to do. But when you're playing tennis or doing stand-up comedy or starting a business or writing a movie, you're kind of setting yourself up for massive anxiety because <laughs> anything that's really worth doing and difficult and highly competitive is not a happy thing. It could be an activity that creates well-being and life satisfaction and a feeling of mastery and community and maybe fin has financial benefits, but it's not fun. And, and you're going to fail often. And so for instance, you mentioned about self-loathing. It's there's two, almost two kinds of self-loathing. There's, there's the shame of, of failing at something or not doing well at something that you thought you should be doing well at or losing all your money or whatever it is. There's enormous shame and self self-loathing that comes with that. And then there's the self-loathing of having the self-loathing. So it's like, you don't want to tell anyone you're feeling this anxious because they don't want to know someone who's that anxious and depressed. So you have to, you have to fake on two levels that, Oh yeah, everything's fine. When you just lost all your money and you're suicidally depressed on top of it. So I think I forgot who said it. Maybe it was Buddha who said it like the first the first arrow will wound you. And the second arrow, which is worrying about the first arrow, will kill you. And that's that's what what happens. And, and so every day becomes a daily practice to try to avoid both arrows. But it's 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 difficult. Yeah. Can I can I turn our attention? I'm, I'm interested no. in. Uh, can I. I. You guys have, have sought help in talk therapy or, or uh, medication or in spiritual exercises or uh, the tools that you talk about. Can you talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of trying to get help for suffering from uh, anxiety and compulsions and things like that? I think it's a, it's, it's like a relate. It's like, like finding a, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you guys are obviously, I haven't been married before and I go, geez, I should be. Cause I, but then I realize you know, it, it, and I, I keep thinking it's because you have to find that perfect chemistry, but I, and I wonder how much of it is me and how much is it is of finding, but 
having gone through every kind of therapy from, you know, cognitive stuff to uh, um, talk therapy, standard talk to uh, biofeedback to, you know, trying a million medications to, uh, I think it's like anything, you're kind of trying to find just the right fit. There's no answer. I mean, I've had, I've had a, maybe a couple of people that I synced up with that I could, I felt like, oh, I can, you know, be myself with most of the therapists I, I dealt with. I mean, I did a movie called numb with Matthew Perry and, and in the movie, he has an affair with this therapist. who's a high ranking, uh, uh, you know, anxiety specialist, which is a thing that really happened in real life. And people it, it thought that was very Mary Steen version plays the, the therapist. And I never told anyone that it was, you know, almost right to a T because it was so fantastic. But then, but the reason that happened, I would say, is because I was trying to charm my therapist because I wanted them to like me. So often I would be in therapy sessions and they thought they was the greatest therapy. I wanted to be the best patient ever. So I, if I could get them laughing, I'd go, well, this guy's, I'm going to give this guy a little bit more. But I would leave not learning anything because I was playing them in a way. And the, and the worst of it came when I ended up having this, you know, affair with one because I, and I realized how, how detrimental that was to me because I was completely not ready for it. And well, it, let's be fair though. There's gotta be some upside to having sex with your therapist. It's cheaper. It's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you get free sessions and they make good muffins on the weekend, but, <laughs> there you, go. but you get free. Yeah. You get free therapy and you, free you therapy. Know, gotta be <laughs> Um, but I, that's part of, you guys are very bright. You're, you're, you're entertaining to tell, but like, is it difficult to find therapists that call bullshit on you? Oh yeah. I think, I think though, like with any profession, any profession at all, like you, like you go to an accountant, 95% of accountants are bad accountants. 5% are good. 95% of lawyers are bad lawyers should, should be plumbers or something and 5% are good and 1% are, are great. And it's the same thing with any, any medical field or, or therapist or whatever. And so I think, you know, like, like Harris said, he's been to a lot of different professionals. I've been to tons of different therapists, psychiatrists, psychopharmacologists, and most are really bad. And so it's hard to know if, Ouch. You, yeah, yeah. You no, know, I'm not, I'm not saying you, I, I, in my experience with all this i've maybe found one talk therapist that lasted for me more than a year she lasted about six years and uh you know it's very difficult to find a good therapist so i tend to use talk therapy almost the way i would use a statistician so oh this talk therapist has seen a thousand different situations similar to what i'm going through so what do what are the positive results uh, in those situations and how did they get to those positive results? So it's almost like what I would ask a, a, someone statistically about the economy or whatever. And, and then psychopharmacologists, there's either ones who give you too much or ones who give you too little and you've got to right, find the right balance. And yeah, but medicine can help too. Uh, medicines, de depression medicine is hard to evaluate because it takes a few weeks to kick in and then you don't really know if it's the medication or something else. Anti-anxiety medication is like a dream come true because it like puts a wall in your head between you and the anxiety. Like you, the, you bump into that wall, but then the downside is you can get a physically, enormously physically addicted. So that's then a, a drag. And, you know, I don't think there's any, any real good from having, uh, you know, any kind of uh, negative sort of anxiety. The good might be only that anxiety is a driving force. And, and when you're not feeling, when it's not mixed with depression or fear or, or frustration, it could be enormously motivating and give you a lot of energy. And like you said, you're on 20,000 RPMs and that takes energy, but for a while you're on 20,000 RPMs, which is more than most people. So I guess that's the good side. Well, I'll add one tweak to, to, to the, to, to the uh, therapy thing. I, 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 I see every profession. I think being a therapist, like I look at you and I go, oh, you seem like a very, you know, sensitive guy. I think it's, it's, it's like in any profession, if you find someone who really, it's an art a little bit, it's a bit science, but it's also 
yeah. if you love what you, you're, you're like I say to myself, am I a good director? What makes, and I go, I'm not, there are a ton of guys who are way more technical than I am, know about camera lenses and CGI. And I go, but the one thing that I, that I, that I know is that I understand that making any kind of visual art, whether it's, you know, a movie or television show is a collaborative thing. So I'm only as good as my editor and the music and the, and the, I was talking about this earlier and the actors. And so I, I look at it as being like a coach. So I've got this big team and the 150 people working around me and they all bring in their problems to, to, to the set. And my job is not to give my vision per se, but it's to go, I kind of know where I'm going. How do I use all of these people to kind of help me get to where I'm getting without, by supporting them as well. So it's a very subtle dance. And I think a good therapist, therapist is the same way. They just, you know, it's a business, you know, if you have, if, I've known therapists that have a million clients and they're Beverly Hills guys, and you go in there and they say their thing and they're very good. And they say the science and you go, okay, we've gone as far as we can here. This is the science. This is what's going on with your background. This is what, these are the tools you can use. That's it. But I think there's a, a side to uh, anxiety, depression, what have you, where it takes almost, it's almost an unspoken magical little thing that you, you, it's almost unexplainable and a good therapist somehow taps into that just like you go what makes a good writer or a good actor or a good it's it, you can't really describe it, it just is and it's just a, a perfect storm of things that you're drawn to that person and they have a way of getting you to the next level you need to get to in a way without being without scaring you away and without being too reassuring so that you're perpetuating what you're doing all the time, I think. Right, and I and I, I really like that in terms of uh, that it 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 literally takes a, a team uh, or uh, a group to get us from A to B, and uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, plant the seeds, other people water, other people harvest, or whatever. Or there's different seasons and different places that we all need to hear from different people as, and. Uh, it, it literally takes a human village. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking guys that you, uh, in your, in the way that you can, your minds are quick and fast and, and that you could easily hide while, while being in therapy, you're still hiding. And I'm also thinking about other first uh, responders that could tend to be doing the same medical doctors uh, nurses, uh, all these these individuals, they they already know the knowledge. They're smart people. They they get it, but uh, they while while looking like they're getting help, they aren't getting help. And and do you ever sit there and play the game in your head, and you know that yeah, you're not really doing the work right now. I know everything I have to, I, I, everything I could do right now to make, take off the weight, but, but I don't do it, you know, because of the a combination of fear of the change, the pain of going through the anxiety of not doing certain OCD things that I get comfort from. Um, uh, yeah. the what ifs, uh, 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 I mean, it's, I go, I go tomorrow or in an hour, if, like I'm doing, again, I'm telling you, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there's something I'm waiting for right now. And I go, if I just get through this and I, I get that call and they go, it's okay. Then I'm going to, I'm going to do it all. But I, am I, am I really? And I go, no, I doubt it. And I go, I've been here before a million times. I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, I've been doing this for the same pattern. So I'm going, something's not right. Or I'm going, I'll, I'll find that one woman, you know, uh, that uh, will, you know, when someone says, if it wasn't for my, you know, thank you for this Academy Award. If it wasn't for my, my wife, she saved my life. And if she's had my everything and, he, and he, he go, I go, yeah, I want one of those. But it's an awfully hard ask because, you, you know, uh, you're looking for someone to go, you're trying to attract them. But at the same time, you're going, am I looking for a mother here or a caretaker? What am I looking for? And, it, and it's, it's confusing. And so ultimately, you know, you know, it's the cliche, which is, you know, you have to find it in yourself or I go, I don't want to find it in myself. It's too, it's too, I, I, I need, I want something else. I want James to solve it for me. I want you to solve it for me, you know, you know, uh, so, uh, but that ultimately is just going to perpetuate more anxiety, which I probably will be after we finish recording this. I, I, I think 
when I've been able to do this daily routine that I described earlier, that's certainly helped me or kept anxiety at bay. But when you're most anxious, when you're waiting for that call or waiting for, you know, something to come through and you start getting more and more burnt out and isolated and anxious, it's harder to, it's harder to, to cling to what your options are because you're just, it's like you're at the top of a funnel and you start going down and, and you know, round and round the funnel and it gets, your options get less, less and less. And you can't, you can't go back to those options because you're just now where I just need that phone call and then I'll feel better. And you know, rationally and intellectually, no, I need to exercise a little, or I need to, you know, call these people or I need to, uh, work on my creativity and focus on right now. You know this intellectually, but it becomes harder and harder to do the more anxious you get. The flip side again, though, is anxiety could drive you to do these positive things, but it, it just depends where you are on that on that spectrum that day. Well, it must be like anxiety. We know that that helping to balance that that fast engine it, and that speeding mind is is to create uh, routine rituals and um, some kind of structure like, like the tennis court and, and the boundaries and the rules. And, and, and so the, the more those become clear, and as one NFL coach said, clarity is everything. And, and when we understand our role or our job or what we're to, what we're to do, it helps an awful lot with the racing mind, et cetera. And so with Chester's rules, there's, there's things you can do, you can't do in strategies. And, and yet it must be strong, a, a real challenge because those that same routines must become ritualistic and almost become OCD in chasing those as the savior. Of you, you know, you know what's been what I found was that's very true. What you just said, by the way, very apropos. But you know what I found it interesting that, that that's helped lately is I've started to read about stoicism, and, and in one line, all that is is, is and I'm very wary about new, but but but. You know, I like ancient things that have been around for thousands of years and they've kind of gone through. And Stoicism basically says the world is a tough, harsh place that's, that you, you're you never going to be able to change all that. But the only thing you can control is your reaction to it. And that was like an epiphany. So like right now I'm going, I'm naturally anxious about this thing I'm talking about. But now I say, can I, I, can I control or have any influence on my reaction to it? And now it becomes like, oh, well, that's interesting. That could be a game. And I go, could I? So I go, you know what? Uh, and that becomes a new skill because that I go, you know, that's that's very, that's very, um, you know, you can you can have. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that's workable. Is because I can't deal with the event because it's uncontrollable. I don't know what's going to happen. It's either going to be this or this or in the middle. But if I react the same way to each one. It's the old, you know, the old, you know, when you go into the Wimbledon final, there's a Roger Kipling quote at the, in, in the uh, change room as you go through. And it says, if you can treat disaster and uh, success just the same, you'll be a, a man, my son, which is don't never get too excited about anything, never get too low, but just stay in that middle. And that's a hard thing to learn, but there is some value in it. So. Some very... That is, it is a challenge when we talk about uh, chasing, chasing the help and understanding and accepting that uh, from what we know is that when it comes to uh, mood disorders and, and some of these uh, illnesses, there is no cure. And yet we still chase it. And we, we still, hopefully we would have a cure one day, but it is, it is rational and normal and human to chase it. And then the chasing becomes a way on which we actually stop and hinder ourselves from actually accepting it. And somehow in the acceptance of it, there is hope or in the understanding that there is something I can do and accept in stoicism, accept that, okay, I can't change what's going to happen in the next five minutes or hour because I don't know what's happening there. So why don't I try to let go? And, and so I think 
part of the hope in dealing with this is that even though we can't change the thing that we so desperately want to change, we can change something. We can we do have some power and, and it's, and I guess those, those tools that we talk about, I think are about tapping into the power that we do have or the strength that we do have, because to be human is not only painful, it's, it's amazing and it's powerful and it's creative and it, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's a beautiful, painful experience. Thank you all said. Guys, thank you so much for being vulnerable, for giving the gift of vulnerability. And um, I have so loved chatting with you. Um, and uh, I, I wish you well in, in all, all that you, uh, not only in your work, but also in your health. And uh, thank you again for, for being with us here today.